guys came to the theater tonight, you probably, we can bring the lights on now, yes, when you guys came to the theater tonight, you probably passed by this guy, right? This guy is a mobile phone tower that's right there on the corner of Irving Place and 15th Street. A nice little family of cell phone towers there and uh, when you got here your phone did something behind your back without you knowing that your phone shook hands with those towers those particular towers are owned by the Verizon people right? and uh, what this shaking hands means is that your phone exchanged protocols with those towers it said hello I am here. I am a, I, I've paid my bill. I belong to this guy. He's allowed to make phone calls. Basically, your phone said, I'm available. Okay? And, and, and the funny thing about this is that little bit of information that you were here, now, available, is going to be stored in the brain of that little cell phone tower for the next 24 months, okay? Just in case someone needs to know. And, and when I look up at those towers, I think, ah, there's a little bit of me up there. There's a little digital shadow going on. Um, now, when they were inventing cell phone towers and cell phones, the hard part was not like speaking long distance. That, that they figured out relatively quickly. The trick was how to make it that you would never, ever lose a signal, right? How to make it that your phone could jump and shake hands with this tower, then this tower, then this tower, then this tower, then this tower, never dropping a beat. You know, you got the little bits of digital shadow everywhere. In fact, your cell phone is really just a, a, a tracking device that happens to make phone calls on the side. Marshall McLuhan, you say TV has turned the world into a global village. Am I right? Will it turn us all into global village idiots? <laughs> Again, uh, not, there are worse fates. Um, an idiot means a very private person. That's a Greek word, meaning a very private person. I'm losing my idiot status steadily. <laughs> I'm becoming less and less private. I'd much rather be an idiot. Well, you know. That was Marshall McLuhan, right? And, uh, and, and Marshall once said, he said, um, uh, when a new environment comes and covers over an old environment, you, you get terror. And what he meant was like when the mechanical age came and covered over the agricultural age, you got terror. And then when the electrical age came and covered over the mechanical age, you got terror. And now we have uh, a sort of... Um, how could you say it, the, our digital shadow, the sort of info world which is covering over our flesh and blood world. And uh, well, the question is, what are we <laughs> gonna get? Enjoy the show. 
me and my shadow strolling down Danke, Chris. the avenue Danke. me and my shadow okay this whole discussion about light and darkness is a big misunderstanding. The idea that light holds the truth or leads to truth and, and darkness always gives birth to evil is a tragic fundamental misunderstanding. I think actually it's the biggest um, mistake in the history of philosophy. You know, these eternal metaphors of the reason, the light of reason, the Fackel der Vernunft, das Licht der Weisheit, the enlightenment. I personally believe that Kant, Humboldt, Jean Locke, Diderot, these gentlemen, they were so flashed, they were so blinded by their own brilliant flashes that they actually never got to see the beauty of the night. Look here. So the red dots are the phone towers. The yellow circles are street lights. Why do we have street lights? So that you can see better at night? Wrong. There are street lights so you can be seen better. In Europe, public lighting was actually introduced by a law. It was put into place by law in Frankfurt and um, London and Paris in the 15th century. People who wanted to leave the house after dark needed to carry a torch. That was obligatory because the police wanted to see who left the house. People who shy away from light are always suspicious to the police. So that means that actually this carrying a torch of the private man was a form of self-incrimination. The public lighting is an invention of the absolute state. There was um, Louis XIV, the Sun King, who wanted to turn Paris into a crazy, brilliant city of light, a ville lumière. And for that, he had all the um, individual lanterns on houses replaced by street lamps. And these street lamps, these new street lamps, were also be put in the middle of the road. And that was completely new because it meant that everybody who wanted to travel Paris by night, from then on, could not you know, do it at the, the, the walls of the houses, couldn't shy away, but you had to do this right in the middle on the examination table of the boulevard, visible for everyone. And as a matter of fact, in those days, people knew very well that light was mainly a tool of control, because it's not by chance that during the French Revolution, gas lights were the first thing that went up in flames. It was later the introduction of electricity that turned this dream of the Ville Lumière, of this shining city, ultimately into a nightmare of a shadowless light from which there is no escape. And but just at the peak of that uh, mechanical uh, triumph came the uh, electric circuit, uh, flooding in the whole electric image and world in 1844, the first year of the commercial telegraph, uh, Kierkegaard published a book called The Concept of Dread. He was quite aware that a new environment had formed around the old mechanical one. And whenever a new environment goes around an old one, there's always new terror. In, we live in a time when we have put a man-made satellite environment around the planet. The planet is no longer nature. It's no longer the external world. It's now the content of an artwork. Nature from now on has to be programmed. Okay, so um, what we're trying to do here is show you a little bit of a piece we made called Anonymous P, Theater Project, and uh, going to set up how that came to be. Uh, we were asked by the city of Zurich if we could do something about Prometheus. Now, Prometheus, you know, he's the guy who, who steals fire from the gods and gives it to man. 
And the idea is, the way this myth is used, is that that's, that's what gives man the ability to be free. That allows him to be creative because that makes man independent. He no longer is dependent on what the, the elites give him, right? And so we were like, yeah, yeah, we want to make a piece about Prometheus. And uh, we got the commission and we got home. And then we were like, yeah, what the fuck are we going to do now, right? We had no idea what to do. And it, luckily or unluckily, I don't know how you want to say it, this was exactly the same time that Snowden was uh, in the transit zone in the Moscow airport. Right? And then a little light flashed. Ah, yeah, Moscow. Snowden is stuck in Russia in some kind of non-place. And uh, Prometheus was then, at the end of his story, chained to a mountain in the Caucasus. And we thought, okay, well, that's a good enough of a connection already. So maybe we'll start there. And, and Snowden steals something from the elites and gives it to uh, um, man so man can be a little bit more free. Prometheus stole fire from the gods. And we say, okay, now we have a concept. Prometheus, Snowden, uh, that flipped into ideas about uh, data privacy and stuff. And then we came up with the last question we needed to try and make a theater piece, which was, all right, if we really, if a new Prometheus came, right, with the same intention to bring something to, to man that would help him be free, right, what would he bring? And we realized the first thing that he would not bring is light. I mean, what's the one thing that we're no longer allowed to have? Well, that's anonymity. So we thought, okay, our Prometheus is going to bring darkness, Okay, our Prometheus is going to bring anonymity in a kind of world where you can't have that anymore. Um, and in the theater pieces we make, um, we usually like to not only talk about things, but actually do them. And um, this is, means we try to create situations in which the specific topics we're talking about, it's always contemporary topics, in which they can also be experienced. And as an um, anonymous piece, a piece about the loss of privacy, it was exactly this what we wanted um, the audience to experience, how we are being stripped by algorithms and also how we are actually stripping, because as we've heard a lot today already, uh, and yesterday, most of the most intimate data out there is actually something we give out um, freely. The problem we were facing when we made the piece was more that everybody knows this. Maybe not when we started to make it, because that was just the beginning of the Snowden revelations, but then the media was full of that. Everybody knows it, and still nobody acts upon this information. So this is then what we decided we wanted to tackle. We wanted to really um, make people, you know, well, or let's put it the other way, digital surveillance is so um, abstract. I think this is a reason why people don't take it for real. You know, it's something that um, you cannot see and it literally doesn't touch you. So this is when we said, okay, we make it our goal to first of all really go into people's phones because we want to do what we're talking about, but also to go under their skin if we can. So we wanted them to feel the creepiness of surveillance, the creepiness of the surveillance of the gadget we're carrying with us all day long, um, the embarrassment of private data being made public because it can be very embarrassing. And um, basically what we thought is, you know, when somebody breaks into their house, what people usually are worried about afterwards is not if something's missing, but it is this feeling that somebody has been in your house. And we thought, okay, if we, maybe that's, that's what we want to make people feel, somebody has been in your house. And to create a situation that makes this possible, we decided to work with hackers. And we did work with two hackers, one American living in Berlin and a Swiss hacker who actually developed the piece with us, but who are also with us then live on stage. Okay, so, so we'll quickly sort of set up what, how we did this. This is our theater space. It's set up like an installation. People were constantly moving about. Um, here we had tables with cameras and stuff. Um, this, this was like Prometheus's liver is sitting over there on the table. We had some performance spaces here. You saw some stuff on the screens over there. But um, most importantly, you see this bigger table in the back. That it was the, the hacker table. Okay, and on that table, I'm sorry, it just went by, um, we had two hackers who were the whole time monitoring the network. Well, actually, to get into the audience's phones, with, which was our goal, the, these phones are not allowed um, to go to sleep, right? You ha they have to be kept active. So the hackers invented a game, for us a profiling game, um, that the audience actually was invited to play all evening long. And I would like to talk a little bit about that while showing you some images. 
Okay, they're there. So before the audience enters the theater hall, they are asked to check into our system. Checking in means here to connect to our Wi-Fi, download a QR code reader in case they don't have it on their phone anyway, and then scan one of the computers, on one of the computers in the lobby, a personal QR code for this evening. Um, these QR code we have generated beforehand. When they do this, several things happen. Um, first of all, people get a printout of their personal QR code and it has a little character name on it. Just wait a second, you can see this person just got the name uh, Meatloaf. Uh, you'll see that in a second. All the names were like either Greek gods or pop stars. Oh, mainly. So and then you, the people had to stick this QR code on their jacket and they would go into the space. Oops. Then other people could scan those people. I mean, everybody could be scanned. Everybody had this QR code. But when you scan somebody, at the same time, you had to answer a few questions about this person. Questions like, um, did this person miss a few of his credit card payments? Um, does this person cheat on his or on his partner? Um, or is this person politically active? So this was information that we collected and that we actually could potentially sell to data brokers because all the questions we chose we know are worth something on the market. And actually every answer people gave, you know, they saw the questions on their screen and they had to check boxes and then immediately a money value would come up, money that we could have made if we sold it or we say we do it in the show. Um, and actually so that people get something out of it, they can get free beer if they make enough money by answering the questions. And this really gets people going. So, so that's the fun part of the game. Actually, people enjoy this much more than I th thought they would because it's a really a simple game. But um, they're having fun, they keep on scanning. But at the same time, and that is more important for our show, the moment the people checked in outside in the computer, they were registered on our database. And so I think, I think what Christiana just said about, okay, it's what we've been hearing in these talks. Uh, you know, we want to get the free stuff. We want to get the free stuff on the internet, whether it's the, the weather or, you know, updates from Google Now. And so um, here, here, wait, let me show you. These, these are all the people who have just registered the Immobilian. I'm going to play that again, if that wasn't clear. Um, um, so as I said, they want to get the free stuff. So we, so we do, like we saw in the beginning, our little performance where we kind of act, if you want to call it that. And then we have all these people, the Immobilien market, the photograph and Cass and Conrad, Elvis, Sancho Panza, Diana, and you can see they're starting to scan each other in the space. And that's what those connections are. Now, while this is happening, I'm going to have to speak fast, we are at the hacker table going through, you can see the, those lists of images there. And I'm just going to show you what that is really quickly. On a good day, it'll be right here. Um, what the audience doesn't know is that when they've checked in, we've done a couple of things. I mean, basically, they get the fun part, the entertainment, us performing, while we're creating a database of them, right? It's the kind of double system. They get entertainment, uh, we get this, we get information. Um, we'll just pick one, okay, here's Pluto. Pluto. Uh, gets the Pluto sticker, has the, this IP address. We can see here that we get the information that's on their phone already. So we know that, Le that Pluto's real name is Lisa, because she typed that into her iPhone, Lisa's iPhone. Um, uh, let's see, the, these are the questions that get asked. We'll go into that a bit later. We can follow here where they've moved in the space because we know which router they've attached to. Is there anything else in this particular one? These are all cookies that their phone picked up during the show. Uh, generally, we can start to see, um, oh, we start to get information about Pluto and the rest of the people. Uh, we build our data. Well, we see, we, we, what we can see, when we, what the hackers see and we see, but mostly then the hackers are doing the job because we are doing the performing. They can see what email address you have, what provider. I mean, we cannot read the emails because we're just monitoring the traffic, but we see where the phone connects. So we know all the apps people have on their phones, if they are using a dating, dating thing, what newspapers they read, what email server they have, stuff like that. Can make that a little louder? 
So the story of Pandora's box is quickly told. I assume that most of you are familiar with the basic story, so I can here concentrate on the last chapter. It's the beginning of the 80s, and the gods are once again extremely annoyed by humans and their Promethean cult, this ongoing blind confusion of technic and culture, of technology and culture. So they get Hephaestus to build a shiny, sexy box that supposedly contains everything. Pan means all, Doron is gift, and Pandora's box is a gift in the form of a box that supposedly contains everything and can do everything. It can calculate, write, play music, take pictures, communicate, near and far, with everyone. Knowledge for everyone, books for everyone, films for everyone, for free. First in California, but soon all over the world. And the humans, they did not hesitate to accept this gift, even though Prometheus himself told them, if those above offer you something for free, do not accept it, as those above never give anything for free that does not come without the price. But then again, you know, this box, it looked so cool. And more than that, it promised independence from those above. We don't need any gods anymore. Lord the elites no hierarchy. We kennen nichts ärmeres unter der Sonne als euch. There's nothing poorer under the sun than thou. Rule yourself your old farts, we are the future. And the future is free of domination. It is a network in which everyone can be a node, no matter what sex, skin color or nationality. All this the box promised. Otherwise Pandora would not have earned her pun. And the gods, well, they actually sneered. When they looked down from their cloud on the triumphant little worm who once again overestimated himself completely in the mirror of technology. You know, and they know they wouldn't have to do a thing to send him back in his dark cave, that this little insatiable worm would once again open the box, the shiny box, all by himself and send all evils over the globe. Only hope they left behind, stuck in the box, you know, right behind the return key, so that this um, beautiful, funny, revolutionary idea of changing the world could be repeated century after century. It is now 1984. It appears IBM wants it all. Apple is perceived to be the only hope to offer IBM a run for its money. Dealers initially welcoming IBM with open arms now fear an IBM dominated and controlled future. They are increasingly and desperately turning back to Apple as the only force that can ensure their future freedom. IBM wants it all and is aiming its guns on its last obstacle to industry control, Apple. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry? The entire information age? Was George Orwell right about 1984? You know, that was about uh, Pandora's box we just heard. There's another thing about the Prometheus story that we had to get into, which was the eagle that keeps coming out uh, and pecking at Prometheus's liver. And, uh, you know, we were thinking about this, and, and, and I went to bed one night and uh, uh, with this going on in my head, and, and in that night, I had a terrible dream. I dreamed 
that I was being chased. I was being chased down the banks of the Hudson and I was running on the Jersey side. I was running and running and, run and I would fall and then this thing would swoop down at me and, and then swoop back up and I ran and it came and, and it got bigger and then flew away and, and, and I know what you're thinking, right? You're thinking that I was being chased by a drone. But it wasn't a drone, it was, it was much worse. I was being chased by a giant search engine. I was being chased by this giant search engine that had like a thousand eyes and breathing fire and lots of wings and it was coming down. I was being chased by the Google, okay? And, 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 and I was going like, whoa, why, why, stop, stop, stop. And it said, you know, Chris, take it easy. We do not want to hurt you. We, we, we just want to get to know you better. And, 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 and it was true. The search engine wasn't trying to hurt me. It was just picking up all those little things I leave behind in a day. You know, like when I buy a, 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 a one-ride metro ticket with my credit card or something like that, or, or an SMS or tweets or Instagram pictures. It was just collecting up all that little bit of, 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 of data. And um, although it didn't hurt, this kind of constant pressure that I found of this thing like pecking at me uh, uh, mm, mm, kind of disturbed me a bit, right? And, and I woke up. In, in a cold sweat, but, but, but all of a sudden the, the eagle made sense to me, you know, because for the Greeks, the liver wasn't, uh, 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 like for us the liver is just an extra object somewhere here, but the real center of a human being is the heart, the brain, for the Greeks it was the liver, because the liver could, could, would always grow and, and regrow and, and, and you could cut it off chunks of it and it would get bigger and you could use it to tell the future. Right? Because you could cut open a sheep's liver and look at the spots and, and you would know what's going to happen. So you had this thing that was growing, um, contained all kinds of information about you, predicted the future. In fact, the liver, in the long run, was the first hard drive. And that's how we made the connection. Um, if you see a brand new expensive luxury home in Pakistan that has no connectivity whatsoever, you might think it's where Osama bin Laden is, right? The fact of the matter is most rich people in these countries are highly connected for all sorts of reasons. They have satellite dishes and so forth. Uh, the fact of the matter is most people are going to be connected for whatever set of reasons. And it may be that countries will ultimately largely ban having hidden people. That the danger of having a hidden person, and I'm not, I'm not arguing in favor of this, I'm just saying governments may choose to do this, because a hidden person is somebody who the police can't figure out quite what they're up to. Um, and in this new world, maybe that will ultimately be important. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. So that was something we were actually very interested in from the start when we did the research on the piece. Is it still possible to disappear, to hide, to get off the grid? And um, this is also why, I don't know if you saw that in the beginning, but on stage we have a hut which is like a replica of the rose hut that he built at Walden Lake when he turned his back on society. And we thought we were going to build a hut in the center of the stage which has no connectivity whatsoever, what he was talking about, where no, like a Faraday cage, where people can go in if they don't want to participate anymore. But needless to say, um, we couldn't technically make this happen, so people were always connected. Um, on top of that, in fact, something that also came up um, yesterday already, I think David Lyon said, you cannot be offline. I mean, you cannot not be in this system. So even people who came without a smartphone, first of all, they could get the QR code and get scanned. But also, we did some research on the people who were coming to the show before they came, because we got the reservation list. Most people buy their tickets nowadays via the internet, so we actually also had their home addresses and their telephone numbers. And we did a Google search, and a lot of people who come to the theater, you can actually... I mean, we always had to take some guesses. Yes. So we just print out, we had to, of course, to guess, because if there was Stephanie Maya and there were only five people, but if you have the city name and the name of the person, most of us do not have to and then we had in the show just like in front of the minority or for a moment. We just, you know, done live, we just slide the pictures the And what was actually interesting is people laugh and they see their pictures. 
or history of somebody that they know, they could be all that. Das ist egal, denn irgendein Bekannter wird das sein. Auf Facebook liegen heute etwa 450 Milliarden Bilder, damit ist nichts mehr los. Das größte Bildarchiv der Welt, täglich kommen etwa 350 Millionen Fotos dazu. An guten Tagen kommen auch noch mehr als eine halbe Milliarde dazu, denn wie Sie sicher mitbekommen haben, hat Facebook im letzten Jahr WhatsApp dazu gekauft. Das heißt, Ihr Bild ist im Archiv. To us, um, and uh, I don't know if you knew that what happened tonight. Did you expect that? Uh, really? Okay. Uh, so Chewbacca here and Phil are going to take you into the huts and try to help you, I guess, uh, resolve this problem. It's soundproof, so we can't hear the discussion. So you're you're all good. So just follow them. Yeah, so uh, this happens sometimes. Um, basically, uh, the environment that we have here is not as special as it looks. Um, what we are doing on this network is just called network monitoring. Um, it could be done, it's, it has a profession, it's so common. Uh, most companies have someone called a network monitor. Um, and this could happen to all of you, uh, what happened here tonight to the three of them. Uh, someone at an internet cafe could uh, monitor the network or your co-workers or uh, anything else and then, and then read your emails like we could for this. And some of you uh, maybe chose not to play the game tonight or, uh, or turned your phone off or pretended that because you thought uh, this was a special circumstance. Which is a real pity because those of you that did that will have no idea if you're protected. But the three people in there, when they come out, at least they'll know. Then, let me uh, put, put that another way. Um, basically, we own your phone. Okay, your phone is now our phone. For example, here All right? Now, to be honest, we're not as good as the NSA. Okay? But we're almost as good as the British Nazis beats. We're just, just a hair under, under the DND there. Um, and, uh, and often in every show we get a, key, a few passwords that have been leaked. We can sometimes get for one, two, oh, three. Okay, so uh, for some reason your phone was uh, leaking your passwords. You can see somewhere here. I don't see it right now. What are you looking for? What he paid for his beer. Ah, oh, where is that? No, I just had that. Also, when people, we have a bar on here. stage, we can see here he bought a beer for six francs. This is quite expensive. This is because he's an Apple user, so Apple users had to pay more, just like in real life. We also learned that today. We had a bar on stage that was cute. People got at times quite ma mad about that, but then also they just teamed up with somebody who had a non-smartphone and they got it for 250. What we can see also here is that this person has opened an Al Jazeera website during the show. I mean, we can see what kind of websites they're looking at. This Al Jazeera website, just as a WikiLeaks website, we put QR codes in the space that people just scan because they're curious, and we guide them to these um, websites. So, and then um, we, we tell them, those who scan WikiLeaks, that, you know, it's not so bad. WikiLeaks is not actually forbidden, but actually it's, on the other hand, not in every country they like, they like WikiLeaks, so we say if you plan to go to the UK and you don't want to be stuck the next three years in the Ecuadorian embassy, empty your cash. That um, fellow there, Der Koch, who had scanned Al Jazeera, of course that is not so funny. We, tell, we, we say if he has plans to go to the US, we should um, advise him not to do that in the next six months at least, because if you stand in front of an immigration officer and they know where you've been to, and you say, oh, but this was only in a theater, and I was playing a game, I didn't know where I was going to, that probably nobody would believe you, and that is also what happens at times. Right, and this is the time of the cookie, oh. and the profile, and the tech credit tracker. How's your credit score, huh? This is the time of triple A. This is the time where you will be ranked and your rank is important because that's the only thing that gods care about. This is the time of the loyalty card. This is the time of payback points on your payback card. We appreciate your participation.
This is the time where you cannot not participate. But don't worry, don't worry, your secret is safe with us. Because this is the time of spies. And this is the time of a million spies all spying in the wrong direction. This is the time of the rogues. When the gaslight was superseded by electric light, Robert Louis Stevenson talked of the horror that heightens all horror. Now this nightmare of the shadowless light from which there is no escape is not over yet. In New York there is 250,000 um, street lights. Most of them are work with normal lights, but as a matter of fact, Bloomberg had promised two years ago, together with the DOT, that by the end of 2017, all of them will be replaced by LED lights. Worldwide, there's about four billion lights. Most of them work with normal lights, but these incandescent lights actually um, are very inefficient because they use up much more energy, and they need to be replaced every two years. So that means that as the 20th century saw how we change from gas lights to electric light, we will probably experience the transition from electric light to LED light. And we might realize what Marshall McLuhan was talking about when he spoke of light as pure information. You've got to imagine four billion lanterns all over the whole wide world. All of them need to be replaced in the foreseeable future and um, they will be there will be um, sensors attached to them. So this, ladies and gentlemen, bodes possibilities, and let me put it in the words of the Californian company Sensity, these new lamps are crying out to be nodes of a brand new network. So the future of light is called Smart Light, and I can assure you that Sensity is only one of the many companies who has Smart Lights in offer. Let us look at one of those Smart Lights. Oh, okay. So what can this light do? First of all, of course, it can shed light. But that is actually one of its less interesting qualities. It can also measure the temperature, the humidity. Um, it can sense earthquakes. Um, it is motion monitoring and it can record all the information it gets on audio and video in uh, high definition quality. So it can record this information but at the same time it can communicate it. What you see here is a gateway to a high speed multi-service open network platform, a 5 gig wireless system that actually supports point-to-point -point and mesh networks. It connects it here to the internet backbone from which it is uploaded to the cloud. This is certainly the biggest amount of information the world has ever seen. From the cloud, the information is sold to different companies who actually make apps from this or with the help of this information that then is sold to us and brightens our lives. This lamp here, for instance, can tell you that you have a free parking space here, which you know comes in handy if you need it. This lamp here can inform the police who shot at whom, at what time, um, when, where, and it also you know, suggests a possible exit way. These lamps here can do even more. They can count. You know, It says, today in this square there were 2,648 people. Somebody slipped and fell here. Somebody is just hanging out. We don't like that. Hey, here's an object in a crowd. We don't know who this belongs to. And what you see here, facial detection in a crowd. This lamp has a Gesichtserkennung software. It can detect faces. So now, when you think about that, four billion nodes for a network that span the globe, actually the NSA PRISM program is small beans in comparison. You know, I, I, we're going to sort of stop. That's sort of the last scene we're going to show you right now. It's a bit hard to do it in this kind of situation, but in, in any case, our show just and does, in fact, end sort of in the middle like this. And what happens in the end is we hand out all the profiles, the audience comes up, the bar stays open, the hackers sort of chat with people, and uh, 
that's what we're going to do now. So thank you for listening to our little kind of mock performance. And uh, I guess we'll talk now. Thanks a lot. Um, Chris, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, the very end of the performance where the audience can see their own profiles and talk to each other, but there's a moment that comes, I think, close to the end that, uh, that I wonder if you could say a little about, which is this kind of um, very poetic fantasy about going dark um, that takes place behind the frosted glass. And, and maybe you could just describe that a little bit as a way to kind of broaden the, the idea of going dark in the piece. Well, uh, one thing I, I should point out, there's a third performer, and while we give a lot of information, there's also somebody who actually talks about a lot of things in a little more poetic way. It might sound too poetic, but in a, you know, he, he doesn't explain so much, but takes people on a journey. So in the end, first of all, he takes people kind of on a journey, saying, okay, if you go home tonight, look up, and describes this kind of futuristic scenario of somebody who decides to break the pattern, get lost, go into, well, the outskirts mm -hmm. where you cannot be um, de trapped anymore, I don't know how to say that. And, um, and he also brings back Prometheus in a sense that he says, you know, he's still out there, he's still hanging there on the rock, but there is a million others on the way, you know, using his name, not using his name, saying they're anonymous P, mm -hmm. and they're, you know, trying to change something. And then, I mean, we were thinking, as I said before, how can you hide, can you disappear? So we also have this segment, it's this one fantasy, you kind of, you leave it all behind, you break the pattern, you go. The other one is a text that you're referring to that I'm going, doing then, mm -hmm. say I'm doing dark, I burn my credit card, I, I have, I, you know, if you grow your hair, what's that, bangs? over your nose, then actually facial recognition does not recognize you, but because it needs a certain line. I mean, there are many ways. I'm just give a list of things we've heard from hackers or from other people, what you can do. You know, of course, you put a little marker on your, over the camera of your computer, or you put a cloth over it. Actually, those are things we have from Jacob Applebaum <laughs> saying, I'm going dark. But this is one of the options in the piece People come often afterwards and ask, oh, is that real? Can I get this list? But we don't know, you know how to protect yourselves or not. I, I just want to say, I mean, in the end, the whole piece is a kind of playing around with different ways of being visible or invisible. And that's what the last text is. We were going to play it here tonight, but then we didn't have the time to really get it all in. But uh, she just it's just a list of ways to, very sad, tragic ways to drop out of the system, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can play it later. And um, on that note, I think one of the things that's so interesting in the piece is this tension between, on the one hand, very practical training for the audience, so someone whose email is leaking goes into the little shed and learns how to change that, and then also the sense of kind of complete impossibility of um, going dark or going off the grid completely. So I wonder if you could talk about how you thought about the audience experience in that way. Is there a kind of way out um, in this piece, or is it really um, more about kind of being aware of this system around you? I mean, the first thing that was really weird to us is we set up this game, as Christiana was saying, and it was really just a kind of excuse to get them to use their phone. And we thought, oh, people are going to think this game is dumb. Basically, they, they scan somebody, and then they answer a question about that person. And the, the audience loves doing that. They, we don't even have to do a show. And in fact, if we don't stop them, then they just ignore us when we try and do our little performance. And they, they're constantly scanning each other. And so it was, that was a very strange thing, that they, that they wanted to be connected. They wanted to use their phone in the theater. And it was, I, I think that was the weirdest thing for us, that, that we couldn't stop them. You know, even at the same time, we were telling, hey, every time you 
click something, we're collecting that, we're tabulating that, uh, we're organizing that. If you happen to send, if you tell somebody, hey, if you send some Instagram pictures in the show, our hackers are going to get it. Well, that just encourages them, you know. So it was a funny, a funny mix. Right, and I think that really that points to this disjuncture that people have been talking about here all day between every time we post on Facebook, we know exactly that we're creating this whole set of data and yet we do it all the time, the kind of joy and pleasure that the audience clearly takes in scanning each other and asking these questions um, totally speaks to that in this really kind of creepy way. But it's also in the same time, there are people who hear beforehand, they've heard about our show, so they come saying they don't have a smartphone mm -hmm. and, um, or not using it. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the one hand, if, you, if people have a smartphone on them, we see that anyway, if they don't declare it, because we're just monitoring the traffic, so we can, and we see which IP numbers are in the room without having checked into the system, so we can actually point them out. If, if it's an Apple phone, we see the name, then we can say, aha, Zara, we know you're in the room, you pretend not to have a smartphone, but we can see you do it. But a lot of people, and then other people, this is what I wanted to say, they know what we're doing, they're afraid we get really um, delicate data, which we do not, as I pointed out, most of it is really just metadata, which of course also is telling, but not so embarrassing. And they switch off their phones during the show, which you know for us is then hard, doesn't make it so much fun. But I don't think these people switch off their phones when they leave the theater. So you know, it's like, right. it seems to be different worlds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say there was one, one thing that we don't show here is, is in the middle of the show, we sort of, start to let the audience know that we know about them. And it's done in the form of a kind of old-fashioned uh, mind-reading thing, like, oh, I'm getting a message about so-and-so. Of course, at the same time, the, the hackers are giving us little cards, you know. And so we're taking the card and say, oh, yeah, the bus, bus fahrer, the bus driver, I think your, your name is, is, is Joe. And Joe, I know you have a, a, a Gmail account, and Joe, to, do you know somebody from another country? Yes, you do, Joe? Okay, well, somebody from another country is sending you a picture, and Joe, you should look at it when you're alone. Now, of course, the end of it is just made up, but you take a little bit of facts, and then you can weave together a story, and then we spend a good 15... We, we wanted to actually try and do that here, but since we don't have the hackers here, it was not so easy to get that going, and it would have been silly to fake it, but... I don't know why right. I said that, but... Right. Um, so I'll just ask one more question and then maybe we'll open it up for um, other people's questions. But I wanted to ask, we've been talking all day about privacy and what's private. And you um, so particularly choose instead the idea of anonymity um, and the word anonymous for the title of your piece. And I wonder if you could just talk about what anonymity means to you and in this piece. Uh, uh, yeah. How <laughs> do you start? <laughs> Well, I guess it's just that if there, it's some kind of, now it must be some kind of magical possibility to not be um, tagged somehow, right? To kind of exist untagged or unnotated. Uh, uh, at least that was the kind of image we had. Out of it. And, and it came out of lots of discussions about, ah, it's only when people have a, have a little bit of sense of being invisible can they actually then do stuff. And in a world where a uh, world of full packet inspection, where everything is captured, recorded, then we, you know, we talked about the chilling effect and stuff. And uh, so that was this kind of the opposite, the thought. Yeah, I don't think that we ne we didn't try to make it differentiation mm -hmm. sure. here. Sure. But as I said, we when we started to think of the piece, actually, I was very interested in the idea of disappearance even before we wanted to make this piece. Think mm -hmm. about another piece. So mm -hmm. this. And that has more to do with being anonymous. That you, you know, it's not, okay, I'm here, and I let you in until here, you know, and, and that the, the rest is private, but can I just do without being right. tracked at all? Right, anonymity only matters in a public sense, right, in a certain way. Um, are there questions from the audience? Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. I would be interested <clears throat> if you, when you think about, you know, as an artist, about the political implications, um, do you have a sense for where the, where the line is between anonymity and, uh, like, let's say, security from, a, from the point of yeah, the state, let's say? So 
do, when, when you hear also the discussions and about you know terrorism and so forth. So do you have also a feeling how like um, um, where like surveillance in a way in a critical way could be could be possible? Do you think about it also as artists? I, th I think I mean we've been here at least all morning long. We're asking the same questions as the people who've been on the podium with our I mean. We're asking those questions ourselves and we ask them in the piece. We were performing in Munich just when the Paris attacks happened the night before. And um, we thought if we should, we wondered what that would do to the audience. First of all, if people would come, because of course in Europe it was very close, you know, Paris, uh, Munich is very close. And then, and I'm talking about Paris as the city of light. I mean, the talk was the little thing about the, and that was, of course, we were like, can we talk about Paris of the Ville Lumière and all that? But um, as for the, for the piece, we thought, we're just gonna do it the way we're doing it. Um, it's clear that after the Paris attacks, there would be a cry out for more surveillance. And we thought maybe it's also people in the audience who would think, oh, yes, if only that had been better, you know, it wouldn't have happened. But um, in this talk of the other actor that I just mentioned, when he goes out to the highway, he actually, he's speaking about that, in that also that he turns on the radio, and the cypherpunks are announcing a new attack, and then the president of the Northern Hemisphere says, oh, we have to you know, widen the, extend the, the, what is that, emergency state um, to the fifth ring of Jupiter or so. So I think we've, yeah, of course we're asking the same questions. We don't necessarily have answers to all of them, but. Well, one thing that maybe it's not about the, the big security questions, but we do actually funny things happen because sometimes in the show we do get stuff that would be that somebody probably doesn't want us to to um, reveal, but mostly like let's say gay pornography pictures and stuff like that, um, and we don't actually. It's really funny. The hackers are super super ethical. Like when we first learned that we could get people's passwords, we're like, yeah, yeah, okay, let's get their password and read their email. They were like, no, they won't do it. And so that's how the scene developed where they go into the house. Um, we also have big questions about whether it's okay to put a QR code on, a, on, a, on the wall that someone might inadvertently or just scan, and if that QR code takes you to a, a ISIS website, is that okay? Because it, are you leaving them with a black spot? And we don't really know the answer because, of course, we, we're not terrorists. Nobody, I mean, and so, but this kind of idea that because we have just a little bit of power, we can make certain little things happen, it makes it a little bit questionable what we do. And we don't always have the answers of how to go about it. But I guess our idea is that the fact that we do everything pretty openly and make everybody, everything we do, people can come and watch over our shoulders and ask us. And we at least try and make visible that we're doing it. But I don't, it's more to bring up the questions. I don't think we really have the answers. Maybe I'll ask one more question if, if no one else has one and then we can um, end. But I wonder if you could tell us uh, which cities you've performed the piece in. And I was thinking while, when you were showing the photo of Irving Place, um, just about the, the very local nature actually of this piece and how we've been talking about kind of the locative turn or the, the way in which um, social media is now so location based actually. And so I wonder if there are differences among um, the kind of research you've done about each city or if you might want to say something about um, that geography of the, the performance. Well, I mean, we, I mean we, what you notice immediately is, okay, you go to Zurich, everybody has a cell phone, right? Everybody, everybody has a, an iPhone 6, mm -hmm. right? And if you go to Freiburg, only half the people even have a smartphone. Uh, we get that kind of demographic information. Um, uh, and, and then, of course, there's just the thing of walking around the city and looking for the cell phone towers, but they're always there somewhere. I didn't expect... I mean, to be so so close and so easy to see. Um. It's the same, the other thing we research is the street lights. And um, I have to say New York is the first city where actually it was announced that every street light will be replaced by LED lights, mm -hmm. which of course doesn't necessarily mean that they're all smart lights, but anyway, it's the possibility. So in, there's other cities where they have, like Berlin has 600 LED lights out of um, also almost 250,000. Street lights, yeah. 
but um, we were going, we were performing in Glasgow, and mm -hmm. as you all know, UK has, is heavily surveyed, and they have cameras everywhere, and we wondered if people would even care. But they did, I guess it's, you know, it's, it's people coming to the theatre, it's kind of the same kind of people, and, and they had the same reaction to what mm -hmm. we were doing mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. elsewhere. I mean, that's different. It's a completely different, it's funny, it's a different audience in here, which seems to be more people who are thinking about this topic and trying to figure out ways to talk about it and what ought to be said about it. Our audience is mostly just kind of people who like Facebook and they like to come into the theater and it, they're, they're not, they're, they're critical, but they don't have that, they're not going so deep into all these topics. You find that like in Glasgow, I think was probably the least informed, um, maybe Berlin the most or maybe Zurich the most. Um, and so in some cities, you get much more of a, wow, I didn't know you, how could you do that? What is all going on there, you know? And maybe just one thing I can add there. Mm -hmm. we, we performed in Freiburg also for, um, there were two school classes. We were asked if, we, if that was okay for us. And of course, I mean, we don't choose our audience. They were quite young. There was a school of 12-year-olds, I mean, a class of 12-year-olds. And then another night, they were like 14, 15. And there we really didn't know if they wouldn't just be all night on their cell phone reading the, their messages and not listening. And it was really funny that these kids who are online all the time and who post everything, they, the young, the 12 year olds was a school of uh, only women, girls. They were so embarrassed that like if you're a 13 year old and see a picture of you when you like, were 11, that freaked them out. I mean, that was like, and we, and it was at Ursuline's Schule, I don't know how to say that in English, but you know, it's a girls' school, well educated parents, nice kids, and they all have been in the local paper because Freiburg is a small town, and they all either play the flute or were in the, you know, won the poetry, something, all of them have been, and then to see themselves or on pictures with their little brother, say, ah, you know, because now they're wearing the first lipstick or so. And that was interesting, and also with the, but I said beforehand that spent some the one person that really freaked out because we had a picture of her friend that she just received by her um, Instagram and we when the hackers see them we print the stuff out and just post it on the hut and and she couldn't get over the fact she said where do you get this picture if, you know this is my friend she's not here how do you know she's my friend mm -hmm. and that was you know that was interesting I guess if you want to be educational as we I guess in a way want to be to see ah it has an effect even on, on kids who do that all the time. And the right. teacher later came up to us and said that, that for them it was really something they hadn't realized in that way before. Right, it has a really powerful effect, in fact, seeing those images um, in a way much more than being told about them or something like this.